Greetings and salutations, dear viewers. I finally get the chance to review a Trapped Optics scope. This one just so happens to be a Torque in the 4 to 20 by 50 variety. I honestly don't know when this video is going to come out, but I'm currently filming this before Christmas. It's actually early December. My son was born just shy of two weeks ago, and that's why I'm talking a little bit quiet so I don't wake him up. Also, my hands are completely destroyed from having to wash them every 25 minutes, so please pardon the cracks and nastiness of them. With all that out of the way, I've been asked to review Tracked Optics for quite some time because they're mostly made in Japan, and for everything I've seen, they're really good. So when I finally got the chance to get one of these for a really good price secondhand, I said, why the hell not? This also came to me in the wake of the ZCO 420, in which I finally got my hands on a 4 to 20 optic, and I actually really like the magnification range. To be brutally honest, for myself, it seems to be one of the more practical magnification ranges that I might actually use on a more precision-oriented rifle. So finding out that I really like that magnification range, these should be really good, and I got it for a really good price, it seemed like a no-brainer. Going over the box, there's not a whole lot to really see. There's stories on the back, and there's a little tag on the side showing you what model this is. This is made in Japan, as are most, if not all, of the Torx models. I could be wrong in saying they all are, so please don't quote me. I'm running on about five hours of sleep over the last three days. Cracking open the box, and you will see that it is very nicely set up. There is no instruction manual on this. The previous owner couldn't find it. He left me a very nice handwritten note. Very nice gentleman, around 74 years old, named Leland. So, Leland, if you're watching this, thank you very much for this deal, because so far, I'm quite impressed with this thing. Cleaning cloth, sunshade, Allen key, don't need any of those right now. Pull this out, and here it is. As you can clearly see, it doesn't come with bikini caps, but rather these just simple rubber caps that get pushed on the front and the back, and well, that's it. Better than nothing. Not as good as a bikini cap, because you could very easily lose one of these. These come off quite easy, and they're not as cool as flip-up caps. But you know what? It's nice to see that at least something is included in the box. So see, what do these go for? These are around $1,300 brand new, and you could find them from multiple different retailers, and I'm sure you could find them on sale for a lot less. I picked this up for under $900, which I feel is a pretty good price considering this thing is practically brand new. 34 and a half ounces doesn't seem too lightweight for what you might consider this thing to be. Is it an MPVO? Is it an HPVO? Well, it kind of splits the line right down the middle. Usually MPVOs start with a 3X and HPVOs a 5X, and usually the HPVOs go to above 25X, and the MPVOs below 20. This is clearly right in the middle, which is probably why I like it so much, because it's just different. One such optic you might be cross-referencing against this Torque is a PST Gen 2 5-25. It's clearly about 3 ounces lighter, and that might be great for you, but the magnification range might be a little bit too high, in which case you can get the 3 15 that's going to be even lighter. These are made in the Philippines, however, and they don't have locking turrets, whereas the Torque does. Now, yes, we can find optics that are going to be heavier than this, some that are going to be lighter, some with more magnification, some with less. So, like I already said, this thing sort of splits the difference right down the middle. Starting at the back, we have a fast focus eyepiece. This does feel like it has a little bit of rubberized texture to it, and it does take a lot of effort to turn, which I really like. There's no sense in having a fast focus eyepiece that's really easy and loose because it can get bumped out of position every time you put it in your bag, under recoil, under you getting behind it, moving the gun. This needs to be tight if it's going to be a fast focus eyepiece like this. And so far, it is incredibly tight. With that, however, it's also incredibly tight in more than one way. Yeah, it's double tight. It's very, 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 very nice. Basically perfect for a fast focus eyepiece, with the exception it doesn't have a locking collar. Beggars can't be choosers. On to the magnification ring, you clearly see we have four to 20. It's exactly 180 degrees out of phase. And you get this kind of little thumb ramp over here. It really needs a throw lever if you could be running this thing fast. But I have my window slightly open. You could hear a jet going overhead. Probably more so than you could hear this magnification ring. There's almost no noise to it. It is very smooth. It is very nicely damped. This is very reminiscent of a Razer HD Gen 2. From there, we're going to check out the illumination control, which, as you can clearly see, goes from 1 to 11 with offs in between. Has a very good solid detent, very deep detent. 
it requires a good amount of force to get it turned over. And once it's there, it stays there. Very good. Good solid feel. Good solid sound. It's everything you want to hear out of illumination dial. One thing though that I don't particularly care for already is the battery compartment. It's the exact same size and has the same splines on the outside as the dial itself for the illumination brightness. And what I don't like about this is if you come over here and you turn this hard enough, you might eventually have it come loose and then you think you're turning the illumination and you're just unscrewing the battery compartment. We have a nice size O-ring at the back shoulder and a nice spring on the inside. And we have a standard CR2032 battery with six fingers holding it in. Removing the battery isn't too difficult. And you can see we have a nice big old spring pad at the bottom putting positive pressure on there. For the price of this thing, that's the bare minimum battery compartment that I expect on this. Continuing forward while we're on the side of the optic, we're going to take a look at the side focus, which clearly goes 800 infinity and all the way down to 25 yards. But notice how short of a sweep that was. You're talking about less than 180 degrees going from its minimum to its maximum distance on the side focus. It's just shy of 180 degrees. However, again, it is well damped and feels buttery, buttery smooth. I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but I love scopes that are designed to have all of the touch points have the exact same sort of feel and style to them. It makes me feel like the designers of this thing really cared and wanted everything to feel uniform. A lot of manufacturers don't do that. However, when they do do that, such as primary arms with the PLX-C, all of the knurling on this is basically identical with the exception of the fast focus eyepiece, which doesn't need to be as aggressive. It just, it, it warms the cockles of my heart because it really just goes to show that they're paying really close attention to detail. And that usually means that the scope itself is going to be really good. Segwaying from that into our next topic of the turrets, there's one thing that I have to mention, and that is the locking component of these turrets, both the elevation and the windage are locking. But as you can very clearly see, they do not require a lot of force whatsoever to disengage. To make this live for you a little bit to understand just how easy it is to open up the lock on these turrets, it opens up before I can lift the scope off the table. This is about 35 ounces. Next to it, we have the Razer LHT, which comes in in the mid 20s, but also has locking turrets. However, you can see I can lift it completely off the table before the lock disengages. This is a little bit better detent from what I'd expect for a potential hunting slash tactical optic because it requires a little bit more force to open up. Last but not least is going to be the Razer HD Gen 2 4.5 to 27. This thing is somewhere in the vicinity of 50 ounces, which is 30 to 40% heavier than the Toric. But guess what? Now it's unlocked. These turrets might be a little bit too stiff for a hunting environment, but they require a lot of force to disengage. You never have to worry about this thing coming unlocked once it's locked. Is it a problem? No, it's just a nitpick and something that I want to illustrate to you guys that this is very easy to come undone. However, the action on it is very, very smooth. I just wish the detent was a little bit tighter on the lock. However, that is the only negative about these turrets. Everything else about them is an absolute positive. They sound and feel phenomenal. Despite the fact that these are locking turrets, there's no play side to side in the erector. There's just a little bit of play between the erector housing and the turret cap itself, but it's so minimal. And adjusting it is a nice, clean break. And unlike some other turrets that we've seen, this does have rotational indicators underneath it, which is a really nice touch. Because if you're here or here, you clearly can tell that you're one revolution or two revolutions above zero. The same could also be said for the windage turret. The exact same style lock, left, right, very clearly illustrated.
This one has a little bit more play to the cap. However, despite the play, you know exactly what detent you are in. And whether it's your cup of tea or not, the color of this thing is just absolutely gorgeous. This matte gray is so unique and stands out in all the right ways. In fact, this thing would look awesome on top of a SIG Cross in 308 with a 16-inch barrel. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's now get behind this thing and see if it looks as good through it as it does looking at it. The build quality and the controls on this thing are well above its price point. The only thing that really pulls a lot from it for me is the locking setup for the turrets. But beyond that, it is truly high end. The MRAD PRS reticle seen here is like most other first focal plane tree style reticles. It's going to have a nice fine center dot and very legible numbers indicating where the holds are. It's very easy to pick up and very easy to read. The illumination on this thing is also fairly good. You can see it here against the bright whiteboard, so it should mean that at least in most darker environments, whether you're shooting in shadows or under the canopy of trees in a hunting environment, it should be more than bright enough to pick up. With the lights turned off, you can see that it is very nicely illuminated with very little to no bleed out. The steps between all of the brightness controls are very linear and progressive, so you could really find the right brightness setting for you in a really dark environment. I also like how they illuminated all the drops as well. Not all reticles do that. As you can see, I only got about 7.8 mils of rotation out of this, and that was with a 50 yard zero for a 22 LR and a zero cant mount. Part of that is due to the fact that this thing has only 20 mils of elevation adjustment, so split that in about half. To really get the most out of this, you need to put it in a high cant mount. Torque Ultra HD at minimum to maximum magnification here at 20X, and the reticle lines up, as you can see, flawlessly. If we adjust the side focus a little bit, you can see we have purple fringing right there, a little bit of green fringing right there, and you can see I go directly to 25 and slightly past that, like literally hitting the stop, you can see how the reticle slides over. I do not like how that is. Uh, makes me a little bit nervous for the robustness of this. Anyway, we can get this thing focused to incredibly sharp levels, and that is great to see. Illumination? is very good on an HPVO and more than sufficient for what you'd ever need this thing for. Looks beautiful down here. Anyway, with the turrets unlocked, we're gonna give this thing a mini box test. The side focus issue that you just saw is something that was a little bit disconcerting and ultimately I think there might be something a little bit wrong with this optic, but you can see that for yourself. So we are four and four and you can clearly see we are a 10th of a mil off on the elevation. Not the greatest start, but let's reset the windage and continue down. Windage looks like it's already favoring the right-hand side of the initial line, but let's see what happens when we add more. One, two, three, and unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, that is our maximum elevation gain on this thing here at 41-ish yards. I don't know if it's the zero stop inside playing around with it. I don't believe it is, but there's something, something a little off with this thing. I'm really going to have to figure that out. I ended up not finding out what the causality of that was. I pulled out the zero stop. It made no difference, but I think it was primarily just because this thing's only got 20 mils of elevation total. We're about 10 from a perfect zero. This being set up for a 50 yard zero for a 22 LR, Fact is it's going to drop a little bit more than it would be for, let's say, a 5.56. Five, so there's your extra two mils or so. However, with the elevation that we did gain, you could already see that the reticle was way off. Never judge a book by its cover. That was something that was taught to me a very long time ago by basically everyone on the planet that was older than me. So far, this thing is seeming to be a little on the questionable side. 
I do understand that we only have 20 total mils of elevation adjustment, so split that in half and factor in a little bit more for that 50 yard zero for the 22 LR. But regardless, we only had about eight mils of adjustable elevation left. Not only that, but the tracking test wasn't on its way to being very confidence inspiring. Just like my book analogy earlier, everything from the outside on this thing is very impressive, but it's what's on the inside that really counts. Focusing our attention on a 30 yard power transformer, I'm going to be showing you the illumination on this thing, however, is not one such item. The illumination on this thing is very good for the, I'm going to finally call it an HPVO. We do see a fair amount of the scope body and the view through it does seem quite small. So the field of view is, I would say, on par with most other optics around this magnification range and price point. It's claimed to have 24.5 feet at 4x and 4.9 feet at 20x. To put that in retrospect against one of its main competitors, which we'll be looking at very soon, the Miopta Optica 6 at 3x is 33.6 feet and 5.7 feet at 18x. So right in line with what you'd expect. Focusing our attention on a 400 yard brick building at 4x, we have a very good looking image and that field of view, like I said, is right around where it should be given its magnification range. The image so far does seem pretty good, but as we get towards the higher end of the magnification, it seems like it loses a little bit of contrast. Now, to many of you, you might be saying, well, adjust the side focus. And I do, as you can very clearly see here. And we can get the image to look pretty good, but it does seem a little soft. But I'm also filming this through a pane glass window. So you might be saying, well, see, you're stupid. Of course it's going to look like crap because you have a piece of glass in between you, the scope, and of course the target. Well, you're absolutely right. But when I open up my window, when, by the way, it's like 75 in my apartment and about 20 degrees outside, once the two airs meet, they make this mirage and or turbulence. This is unfortunately as good as it's going to get while I'm filming in these cold conditions. As a result, I'm not going to spend too much time here on the rooftop segment. We're going to spend a lot more time later on at large bore where we'll at least have less turbulent winds to deal with. We do see a slight uptick in contrast, but we also see a little bit more chromatic aberration towards the top part of that brick building on that little event. But beyond that, it's not terrible. However, given the amount of mirage that we have here, it is quite challenging to pick apart this image beyond what we can currently see in front of us, which is hit or miss sometimes. And you guessed it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that at 800 yards, we're probably going to have a little bit harder of a time viewing that power tower than we did at the 400 yard brick building, just because the extra distance. At 30 yards, however, those lines look great, but there is heavy chromatic aberration that appears on the top one. If it sounds like I'm saying a bunch of negatives, it's kind of true, but there is a positive that we can take away from this. And it's most of the controls. I say most because not all, but the side focus on this thing is very smooth, very well damped and very quick to get on target, whether it's at 800 yards here or 30 yards on those power lines. Now, the only reason why I go out to a thousand yards with this optic is just to see if it's going to have a different image looking through it when we dial up for elevation. Now, for every scope that I've ever done, I dial up to at least 10 mils. Unfortunately, with this optic, I can only dial up to eight. Here at zero added mils on our elevation, we have a fairly good looking image despite all that heavy mirage. Adding our plus eight mils of elevation and you can see the image does appear a little darker. But fear not, it's only a very minor shift to the eye box. We actually have to bring our head a little bit farther down, about a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch, to look through it with full maximum brightness like we saw earlier. That is a very good thing. And when we put these two images side by side, you'd be kind of hard pressed to figure out which one is which, primarily because of the amount of mirage that we have, but also because these two images are really, really close together. Granted, if they were on a picture perfect day, we might be able to find more information. But as of right now, can you tell which one is which? That's right. I didn't think so. The one on the right is plus eight and the one on the left is zero. I've mentioned it already, but the illumination is another positive on this thing. We're looking through again at the 400 yard brick building, but this day on a much warmer day where the mirage isn't going to be as dramatic. However, it was raining, so it's going to make the image not look that great. But it's also nice to see how well this thing can combat inclement weather, rain, snow, fog. I can't get all of them, unfortunately, but in this case, I was able to get a good amount of rain. Not only does the illumination look fantastic here, but so does the image. At 400 yards, we're looking through a very heavy mist to very light precipitation, which is a very real condition that you guys might be shooting in. And it's nice to be able to see if the scope can look through that. In this case, there's no problems whatsoever. 
The intensity steps on the illumination are also very nice to see because there are actual steps. It's not like it goes from maximum on to basically off. The reticle is also very nice. I like the fine center dot and I like how they have the very small to medium peaks depending on whether you're on two tenths, half or one full mil. So maybe it's just a stickler in me. I do like it when manufacturers do all the numbers and not just odds or evens. In this case, it's two, four, six, eight. I would like to see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I know it would cloud up the reticle a little bit more and some manufacturers do it better than others, but I don't think it would really take away from the overall experience using this thing if they just put a one, a three, and a five there. The sun has set over the horizon. The air is very still, and thus we have no mirage. Looking on to the great horizon, you can see that we have a very clear change of the color palette looking from outside the scope at that blue and slightly orange sky through this gray sort of mass looking through this scope. It's not that uncommon to see the color palette change when you're looking through a magnified optic in very low light conditions. A quick twist of the illumination control shows that this thing is again performing extremely well for an HPVO. Very bright with very clear steps in between different intensities. Many optics here will fall on its face when you bring it up to its maximum magnification. But here at 20x, you don't really see a drop in brightness coming through the glass. And the illumination, again, is stupid. Most HPVOs will be about that intensity right there. This thing's third brightest. The illumination continues to prove that it is excellent, but so is the glass as far as light transparency goes. This is where a lot of optics fall flat on their face. Usually they don't let that much light in in darker environments like this or even in the gray areas through the rain earlier. It's honestly where the scope shine is the best. Finally, we have really nice weather conditions. It's bright, it's sunny, and the air is very still. So we're going to get the most out of this image as possible. Here at 50 yards, it's a really good test for a lot of people because either A, you're a rimfire shooter like myself and you spend a lot of time at 50 yards, or B, maybe that's just what you're limited to in your backyard. Which, if that's the case, I'm really jealous of you being able to shoot in your backyard. If I had that option, I'd probably never leave home. As you probably picked up when we panned across the line, the 4X on this thing is very nice and flat, lets in a lot of light, and has good color representation, probably mostly because of that high-density glass. All in all, it's really nice, with the exception of that it's just really, really small to look through. When I make the comparison with the Optica 6, which is also regarded as a very small optic to look through, you'll see that this is still significantly smaller. And honestly, it goes more than just how well this thing performs on paper, or in one area or the other. There's something about the scope that, when it's added up, just didn't sit well with me. And of course, I'm going to talk about that more during my final conclusion, coming up fairly soon. But here at 50 yards, at 20x, we have a very good, sharp, bright image. You do see a little bit of chromatic aberration, both of the green and the purple variety, whether you're too far in or too far out of focus. And here at 50 yards, the 20x is more than large enough, and the image is more than sharp enough to pick up those 22 LR holes with ease. The iBox also gives us a pretty good performance down here at 4x. As you can see, we can get very far away from it or very close up tight on it and still have a decent enough image looking through it to be able to pick up our target and our reticle, honestly, quite well. Unfortunately, this is only at 4x. Increasing the magnification here to 10x, you're going to see that the image gets significantly tighter looking through it, or rather the ability to get behind it easier sort of diminishes itself. This is going to be common on any optic once you start bringing it to its maximum magnification or there or thereabouts, but it's still not the end of the world. At 20x though, to be expected with any HPVO, it's going to be tight. This does seem a little bit tighter than average, really forcing you to have really good fundamentals behind the gun and a really solid cheek weld and position. So it wouldn't be a full-on c does or Pew unless I brought some optics in to compare this against. And the first one's going to be the Miopta Optica 6 3-18. This is my baby, it's my bread and butter, it is perhaps my favorite MPVO of this magnification range, and for good reason. Here at 3x, you're going to see 33.6 feet versus the Torx 24.5 feet at 100 yards, which is what you're seeing before you. That's just because 3x versus 4x, scope to scope. At maximum magnification at 100 yards, the Miopticus 6 is going to have 5.7 feet to the Torx 4.9. And it doesn't stop there. The Miopticus is actually 4 ounces lighter and $500 less expensive. 
I also give the illumination to the Miopta as well as the depth of field. Just look at the difference between the target and the berm here at 100 yards and about 180 yards respectively. On top of that, look at the view through it. The Miopta is larger than this Torque, not by much, but it's enough to make a difference. We also see less scope body with the Miopta, and it's just a better overall performance in my opinion. Next on the roster is the Vortex Razor LHT 4.5-22. This is a scope that I didn't think I was going to like as much as I do, but I actually love this damn thing. This comes in even lighter by 12 ounces. This is 22 ounces and the exact same cost as the Torque. It is $1,300. The field of view on this thing is a foot smaller, but it is half X farther in at 4.5. But at its maximum, it's got about the same field of view. 20x versus 22x again i'm going to have to give the image to the razor as well as the depth of field ever so much but it does have 2x more on the magnification and as far as the view through it and the scope body there is a clear winner the razor literally just dissolves into this beautiful floating mass in front of you it does have a slightly tighter eye box but it's a very beautiful and well-functioned scope for what it is to bridge hunting and tactical into one scope and for that it works splendidly. Illumination's about on par between the two. Last up in this roster is the Vortex Razor HD Gen 2 3-18. Notice that I'm primarily focusing the comparison against this Torque with other MPVOs, not HPVOs. Despite the fact I called the Torque an HPVO earlier, it really just sort of fights its way out of the MPVO category by the skin of its teeth. And here it's very plain to see. We have 13 extra feet on the field of view at its minimum, and at its maximum, the Razer HD has almost two full feet on it. It is huge by comparison, but it's also significantly heavier by about 12 ounces, and it's a little bit more expensive by about $400. But these two scopes are not cut from the same cloth. The Gen 2 Razer HDs are designed from the ground up to be as robust and as tactical as possible. And you can see by just looking through the giant field of view to the Razer compared to this Toric, and just the depth of field and the little scope body that you see with the Razers, there really is no comparison between the two. It, they're just completely different animals. Focusing our attention on the 180 yard berm behind the paper targets, we keep the same optics in the same order. So first up with the Miopta Optica 6. Again, I'm going to give it to the Miopta. Here, the image just looks a little bit clearer and sharper, and it's just the way that it always is going to be between these two. There's nothing wrong with the Torque by itself, but when you start comparing it to some of its rivals, it doesn't have the same appeal. Same thing can be said here with the LHT. Granted, they were filmed on two totally different days, but the LHT just has a little bit more life to the image. Yeah, there's more colors, it's green, and it was a little bit brighter out, but the LHT as well as the other razor in this comparison, just have a lot more depth to the image. And that's really important in most cases. You want to be able to see what things are different out in the field as opposed to just having a sea of the same color. Granted, this is not the most ideal situation for the Torque to be filmed in, but it was the best that I had at the time. Finishing up this segment with the Gen 2 Razor HD, it just becomes even more apparent how much better it is than the Torque here. But keep in mind, it's... A completely different animal it's heavier it's more expensive but man oh man that sweet sweet juicy image that it produces focusing our attention now at the 200 yard paper and it could be said the opposite you might think that the torque has a better looking image here than it does with miopta and you might be right to some extent the light changes a little bit and an image can go from looking fantastic to looking somewhat mediocre and unfortunately uh it's actually a negative against the torque but more on that very soon. The sun had come out for the Torque, and you could see the LHT was filmed in basically the middle of the summer, bright sunny day. But you could also see some chromatic aberration picking up around the target on the Torque. And that's going to be brought up uh, again very soon, because that's one of the things Achilles heals. But finishing up this roster again with the Gen 2 Razor HD just proves that it is king of the hill when it comes to all four of these. Why am I not Comparing it against the 4.5 to 27 Gen 2 Razor HD, that's because I think this 3.5 compares a little bit better against the 4 to 20 magnification range. If I was to step it up to the 4.5 to 27, you're talking about 7 more X at its maximum and about the same on its minimum. It would just destroy the thing. 300 yards is where we're going to end this. Again, starting with the Miopta Optica 6, 
There were no targets that I focused on, more or less just the steel targets. But given this a really nice deep crop, you can see that both of these produce fairly sharp looking images. But the chromatic aberration on the Toric is real. And unfortunately, it's way worse than that in person than what we see here on camera. I'm only going to get into a little bit right now, but it's way worse in person, so much so that it's actually just frustrating. The LHT, though, is excellent. And again, those colors are very vibrant and poppy. Again, though, the lighting situation was not ideal with the track torque, but with the LHT, we had very high heat that day, and you can very clearly see the mirage that it was producing. As a result, though, the image is a little skewed on the LHT, but I still think that there's a little bit more sharpness and resolution to the LHT's glass as opposed to the torque. And when I say resolution, I just mean information that the glass is passing through to you. Keep in mind, the more information, the better. The illumination here on the LHT is also fantastic. But again, the king of the hill of this comparison is going to be the Gen 2 Razer HD. But just because something has a larger view through it, or less scope body, or larger field of view, or just a little bit sharper, crisper image, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the best optic for you. I put this comparison here to give you an idea of how a, one optic is going to work compared to the other. If you're okay with the weight, if you're okay with the expense, of course, something like the Gen 2 Razer HD is going to be better than the Toric. But if you want to save money or spend the same amount of money and look for something a little bit different, the Miopta Optica 6 and the Razer LHT are two totally viable options. I paid about $900 used for this thing from the original owner. The week that I finished filming with it, I took some pictures, I boxed it up, and I managed to sell it for about the same price. I'm very glad that I was able to get my money back on it. But why did I sell it? Well, it's going to take a little bit of time to explain it, but I sold it because this thing on paper is basically everything I was looking for for a 4 to 20 optic. After reviewing Scott's ZCO 420, I really fell in love with the magnification range. And this is the first 4 to 20 first focal plane that came up in or around my price point. There are some other options from like Night Force, but you're talking about 3 grand plus, And I can't justify spending that much on a single optic. So when this thing popped up for 900 bucks and I did some research on it, I said, this is everything I'm looking for. Every piece of information I found on the Track Torque lineup, all the reviews were glowing positive, and I said, you know what, for 900 bucks, I'll give it a shot. Even for $1,300, I think I would have bit the bullet just to try it out, because again, on paper, it's excellent. And at the time when I bought this, I had my heart set on a SIG Cross 16-inch and 308, and I thought the two colorations of gray on gray would just look fantastic. But like I had mentioned earlier, never judge a book by its cover. And this is the perfect case in point. This thing from an exterior standpoint does a lot of things well. All of the controls that you touch are phenomenal with the exception of the turrets. But more so just the locking feature on it. Honestly, if they remove the locking feature, I'd be more acceptive of it. But it's so bad that I pulled this scope out of my bag and the lock on the windage was already starting to come undone. For many people, that's not a worry. But for me, if something doesn't function the way it's supposed to from the factory for long term, it bothers me. Because why even have it if it's not going to do its job properly? The turrets, other than the locking feature, are superb. They sound great and they feel great. But again, it sucks that I only managed to get 8 mils of added elevation from my 50 yard zero for my 22LR. For many of you out there, you might say, see, don't be an idiot run a canted base or mount, and have it set up properly for whatever setup you're running it on. And I agree with you on that. But this is the first time that an MPVO or an HPVO has given me elevation stoppage on my tracking test. Yes, this is a 30mm tube, but so are many of the scopes that I review, and I've never had that problem happen before. It's more annoying than anything else, but it's still something that happened. The next point of contention is the view through it. It is noticeably smaller than the Optica 6 when you get behind it. And the Miopta Optica 6 is already on the smaller side, especially when you compare it to something like the PST Gen 2. Why didn't I roll that in? I don't have really good footage of it for large bore like as we see here, and it's on long-term loan to my brother out in PA, and I haven't seen him in a while, so I wasn't going to get it in time to finish this review. Even though this thing has a large eye box, when you put it in conjunction with the view going through it, it just seems so lacking. I'd honestly rather have a 5x minimum with a larger view through it, maybe even the same field of view, and even a tighter eye box than what we have before us. 
But the final nail in the coffin is the one thing I couldn't really represent on camera, and that is the severe amount of chromatic aberration here in the bright sunny weather on this range. You might not notice it all the time, but when the sun is out just right, those targets push back a lot of chromatic aberration, and it was something that you couldn't get around. For me, it made the entire experience miserable. I also wasn't the only one to notice it. I put a couple people behind this scope and they all noticed the exact same thing. For me, chromatic aberration is something that really bothers me. And I can deal with it on the edge of an image. Like you could just pick it up on the edge of the target against the berm here. But when it's the entire image, or rather the entire backer of the target, it's just, it's just something you can't, you, you can't escape. And at that point it becomes completely unacceptable. So add up all of those nuances together, and that is why I sold this optic off. Again, it's one of those things that I think I hyped up myself a little bit too much, and when I got it, I was just let down. Maybe if I went into this optic not knowing anything about it, and its track record, and how much people liked it, maybe I could have viewed it a little bit differently. But the fact still remains, some of the competitors that I put it up against here today are all slightly better than it for the, the same price or less. The Miopta Optica 6 is $400 less minimum, minimum, brand new. And the LHT is the exact same price. The Razer HD Gen 2 is about the same price, but you can find them used for much less. So it's all in relation to what you're willing to pay for a particular optic. If you're dead set on this thing and you love it and you've had it and it's great, then kudos to you. I'm glad it works out for you. But if you're like me and you're looking for something that's going to have the edge on everything else, there are other options out there for you. Whether you love this review or you hate it and you're going to curse me in the comments and you say you're completely wrong, you're entitled to your opinion, and that's perfectly fine. But my findings here are a little bit subpar to what I would normally expect for an optic. And as a result, it doesn't get the glowing review that I was hoping to give it. Again, because it has all those little tiny problems that add up to one big problem, and that problem is with the overall experience. If you don't have a good experience with something as a whole, then is it really even worth it? To me, the answer is no. And with that, thank you all very much for watching. As always, see you again next time. And a huge thank you to my Patreon providers and my Subscribestar subscribers. Without you, this truly wouldn't be possible. If you'd like to support my channel but don't want to join either of those, I completely understand but you could still help by using my affiliate links in the description below and or like, share, and subscribe as always. Again, thank you very much.